I am Deborah Brody, the director of Stanford Center on the Legal Profession, uh, with a brief thank you to all who are here and a special thanks to our panelists. Many of us at the law school and the broader legal community read what shocked the article in the New York Times this summer, um, written by one of our distinguished hey, panelists. Apparently, she's not hearing you. She's All right, I'll try again. Is that better? OK. Uh, many of us here at the law school and broader legal community read with shock the article in the New York Times this summer, written by one of our distinguished panelists, Elaine Zimmerman. The article described the death of her husband, Peter, a Wilson Sonsini partner, from an infection related to drug abuse. It is, of course, no secret that many in the legal profession struggle with mental health and substance abuse issues. But this particular article brought home how serious these issues can be, particularly when others look the other way or fail to look at all. Those of us at the Center on the Legal Profession, along with its co-sponsors, the Office of Student Affairs and the Stanford Law Association, hope that this event serves not just to highlight the challenges, but also to offer some strategies for law students and practitioners, not just to cope, but to thrive in our chosen profession. Special thanks to Joe Bankman for leading Stanford Law School's efforts to create a positive and open environment for mental and health issues mental health issues and for moderating today's panel. And special thanks also to Lucy Rica, the executive director of the Center on the Legal Profession, who did all the hard work in making this event happen. And of course, special thanks to all of our panelists whom Joe will now introduce. Well, thank you. My first job is to make sure this is on. And I think I've succeeded in that. Uh, I'm just going to introduce the panelists uh, briefly, and then uh, we're going to talk about various issues. We've put little file cards in front of you with the thought that if you have questions that you want us to address, write them down, and we'll send people periodically to pick them up so that in the Q&A time, we're going to be ready to, uh, to answer your questions. And, uh, because we have so much uh, to talk about, apart from thanking uh, the Center and our student associations and the other sponsors, and of course thanking all of you uh, uh, for coming here, I'm just going to jump right in and introduce our panelists. And uh, to my left is Andy Benjamin. Andy's a psychologist and lawyer, is a clinical professor both of uh, 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 psychology at University of Wisconsin at Washington. Uh, and uh, uh, an affiliate professor of law at University of Washington. He's written scores of peer-reviewed articles. If you want to know uh, what is the problem of alcohol, for example, uh, uh, among lawyers, Andy is, uh, is, along with one of our other guests, Patrick, is the person to go to. But Andy's done a lot more than that. Uh, he's going to talk to us about uh, work he does with law students and how to kind of work toward health if you're in this environment. Uh, and he's also won a host of professional awards. The, the one I like the best, and it goes on and on in terms of organizations that's honored Andy for his life's work, is won by, and tell me if this pronunciation is wrong. Piala. Piala. Indian Nations uh, Health Authority for serving as a modern day warrior fighting mental illness, drug, alcohol addictions of the people served uh, by the nation's program. So welcome, Andy. Uh, uh, Patrick uh, Krill is another panelist. And I associate Patrick in particular with someone who gives us some bottom lines on uh, what the problem is among lawyers. And when I say the problem, I mean uh, closely linked problems of substance abuse and stress and anxiety and depression. Uh, he's uh, uh, written scores of articles, a former director of Hazleton Betty Ford Foundation legal professional uh, program, and uh, 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 serves on the advisory committee to the ABA Commission on Lawyer Assistance, a member of the National Task Force on Lawyer Well-Being, and was presented with 
Well, I won't go into the awards, but thank you, uh, Patrick. And finally, I want to pick up where Deborah started with uh, Eileen. Uh, Eileen is a person who uh, uh, wrote just an unforgettable article, The Lawyer, the Addict. And could I have a show of hands on how many people here have seen that article? It really is everyone. And it says uh, how meaningful it is for us to, to think about that article. And I think it's to some extent true, Eileen, that that article gave us space to talk about this and hold these conferences. And uh, uh, I'm only going to, I have one paragraph, if you don't mind. I'd like to quote from the article. There's so many unforgettable things in there. One of them is the image of Peter's funeral. People are overlooking the Pacific. They're overcome with grief. And this is one of our own, in a sense. He's a partner at Wilson Sun City. That's kind of the home team uh, 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 law firm. Uh, overcome with grief, but they're also bent over texting and emailing, even at that time. And the other thing uh, that I'll read, which I think is so sobering, is for the last two years of his life, every time Peter and I were together, back to school night, our son's cross country meets, our daughter's high school graduation, people would ask if he was okay. They asked if he had cancer, an eating disorder, a metabolic disorder, AIDS, but they never asked about drugs. Drugs didn't cross my mind either, not even the day I found his body surrounded by drug paraphernalia and called 911. <coughs> so thank you, Eileen, for sharing that with us. And I'd like to give you the opportunity to start. The way we organize it, we're going to talk for about 15 minutes each, 10, 15. And you're now embarked on a book, I think, looking at the wider question. So tell us about it. Uh, uh, do you want me to tell you about um, the talk about the article first and then the book? Sure. So uh, as you know, I wrote this article after I um, found Peter had died. And, um, and I was shocked by the fact that um, I was shocked by what I didn't see when I found him, which was all this drug paraphernalia that I was later able to see in um, police photos. Actually, just recently, because I'm writing a book and I wanted to, one of the things I want to figure out is what does your brain do kind of in a situation like that? And maybe what happened all along? Because Peter was really, really sick. I mean, you knew something was wrong, but. Um, I never thought drug abuse, and then after I found out that that's what it was, it was so obvious that that's what it was. You know, he never wore short, short sleeves. He was shivering in the middle of summer. His head looked too big for his body. He didn't eat anything but sweets, like all of these things. He was up all night. My kids would say, you know, I, that he had insomnia, and I thought it was the stress of his job, which, you know, I think it definitely contributed to that. And. Um, after I wrote that story, it got an enormous amount of traction. And I think, um, although I appreciate all the compliments on the writing, I think it struck a chord because I think it's more true than we think. I think there's a lot more suffering in law, but in lots of high power, high money, high prestige professions. And um, I think a, a lot of it is male, not all of it, obviously. But there's also this reticence to admit that you have a problem. Patrick knows this very well. Um, because it's not like, even though Peter was an extreme example, he was shooting up, there's definitely widespread use of performance enhancing drugs like amphetamines, whether that's Coke or Adderall. Peter had bags of meth, which I had to look up on the internet having never seen it. Um, I know there's um, lots of people in, uh, that are lawyers that take pain medication. Sometimes they take it to sleep. There's a lot of abuse of benzodiazepines and things like that. And um, so, uh, my, qu and my question in my mind is something I can't ask Peter is, you know, why? So this is a guy that was um, at one point healthy. He has two great kids. Uh, we were divorced for five years, but we didn't have um, a lot of animosity. We worked together really well. He had relationships with other people, romantic and otherwise. He had a beautiful house that was like architecturally significant in the favorite place he wanted to be, and he had the resources to get as much help as he needed. But he didn't. Instead, he decided to kind of, I, I hate this term, but self-medicate. He decided, like, I can handle it. I can handle it. And even um, when he died, I found uh, lots of packages of um, kind of a, I don't think it's, a, it's sort of a natural remedy to help you through withdrawal. It's withdrawal ease, all of these. 
pill bottles that hadn't been opened and um, directions for how to use it and how to start. And I, I think, you know, the addiction became much more powerful than he figured it would be. And part of that is probably some of the arrogance in the profession. You know, he was a really powerful partner. He was really good at what he did. He was very smart. So he probably figured, you know, I'm not going to be an addict like other people. This isn't hillbilly elegy. I'm going to, you know, I'll be fine. I'm just going to do it to relax. Um, and so it made me look into that more. And also, um, based on that story, I sold a book to Random House about what happened to Peter, but also kind of what's happening to all of us. Um, and so for me, the question is, you know, every, everybody says sort of like, what's wrong? Like, everything is great. So why are we unhappy or discontent or restless? And I think there's lots of different reasons. But one of the components is almost certainly the pressure in corporate America, in law firms, in banks, in Silicon Valley, in the tech sector. I've been on... Um, Hacker News and Reddit, they had threads after the piece came out. And there were young, mostly men, on these sites talking about their dependencies on Adderall and Xanax and Coke and how they feel this pressure to compete and everybody else is taking it. And I just felt like this is sort of a problem that we're not acknowledging. And, and what is behind it? Is it co-occurring mental illnesses? Are people that are attracted to these professions also more prone to be bipolar or depressed or anxious? Annie can answer that. So that's my investigation now, is I'm trying to figure that out. And I'm also trying to figure out um, ways that the workplace can change to, um, to make it not so scary for somebody that's in trouble to say, I need help. I mean, I think I put in that piece, Peter got a, a delivery of tourniquets from Amazon. I mean, he was opening them there. And I know this because somebody at his firm told me. And, um, and this person had the power to say to him, what is going on? Like to close the door and say, like you look like a skeleton. You're, you know, like are you diabetic? What, you know, what, something. But I asked him um, why he didn't ask Peter what was wrong, and he said, "This has an expletive in it." But he said, "We don't get into each other's shit." He said, "It's not, you know." I think the bottom line is he didn't say this, but I think the bottom line was that Peter was billing hours, and so you know maybe he had cancer. Maybe at AIDS, maybe at, they didn't, you know, it wasn't their business. If he asked for help, he would. But I think, I don't know how many people use their EAPs. I mean, I think that's, obviously that's not working because there's a lot of struggling. And Peter felt an enormous amount of pressure in, to support his family and also to keep up at the firm. And obviously, the more he made, the more things he bought. And I just think there was this restless unhappiness um, that he was obviously trying to fill. And one other thing I'll say is, and this plays to Andy's work, is that um, I've interviewed a lot of people that knew Peter when he was at Cornell and when we were broke and we were first together. And certainly, you know, whatever damage or whatever trauma Peter had as a child or an adolescent that played into what was going on with his depression and anxiety is one thing. But I can tell you that he was a really gentle, sweet guy when we got together. In fact, at grad school for chemistry, he worked with a lot of people in the lab that were from India, and they just happened to be much shorter than him, and so they would always call him the gentle giant. Like, he was really sweet. But something happened after 17 years of this chronic, punishing stress. And my friends that knew him when we were first together would say to me, what happened to him? Mm. And I remember thinking, something, something is different about his brain. Something has changed. He, he was not the same person. And I don't know what that is, and I'm hoping that the researchers up here and people in the profession will do more to find out how to how to alleviate that, how to make it better. So that's where I'm at. Do we, you know, I, I want to give us uh, a little space if we have questions or comments for you, Eileen, and then we'll take everybody in. One of the things I'm wondering, apart from again just being so touched by the story and your willingness to go there, which must be so hard. Yeah. Uh, uh, when you read the Reddit interviews, Stanford Law School is undergoing a period where we're trying to see, are there special stresses of, say, marginalized people? When you read who's writing into to, to Reddit, we get some people that look like this is kind of a white male that had everything going for them. But do you get other people's viewpoints? And do you get a sense of that? Because now you're talking to kind of the world of people in these law firms? Uh, 
Uh, you know, lawyers are so reticent to admit a weakness. I mean, it's, at least the men I've talked to, you know, like they, it, you know, Peter was too, but I will say the people on um, the Hacker News threads, and I'm going to put a query out on Hacker News so that people can kind of um, anonymously, just using their handles, tell me what they're seeing in, as um, programmers and engineers. But one of the things I noticed, which is heartbreaking, and it, these were some young men, is that they're really lonely. Like they spend all day programming, right? And they want to get ahead. They think the only way they can get ahead is to take them, do lots of Adderall or Ritalin or Coke. Or, uh, and then one guy said at night, he, he's not interested in anything and he just waits to go to bed. And it, like, that's heartbreaking. You know, I think that the problem is they're isolated, there's no community. So you're right, maybe, and these guys are all talking a lot about anxiety. There's so much anxiety that they're either going to lose their job, they're not going to move ahead. There's a lot of competition. Somebody's better. Somebody's got, a, you know, had a better education. One guy was talking about his school wasn't Stanford. Other people are like Cornell's really good, you know. And they're every they, you know, it just and it felt like in the end, you know, they have this virtual community because they don't have a real community. Yeah. I know that Peter would come home, and even though we would have gone to let's say like a firm event and been nice to all the, other, he would completely tear apart the guys at the other end of the hall that were competing for the same company as he was. You know, and he would say, I'll, I'll say this guy's name is Joe, it's not. And he would say, you know, Joe doesn't have any kids, so it's easy for him to fly to all these entrepreneurial things. And, you know, like we were holding him back, you know. And and I know he, he couldn't help it because that was the culture. The culture was like, you know, you get in there and it's like a knife fight. You know, yeah. everybody's going after the, the hours and the business. And I don't know if that helps. Yeah. yeah. And he's not in CC. <laughs> Andy? On words? Yeah. So go, okay. Yeah. So um, just for the record, this was the most compelling piece of journalism I've ever read. I've been in this field um, for 35 years, actively working on these issues. And I, 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 we really owe a debt. I think you, you kind of helped pierce a bunch of denial and a lot of minimization that was going on in this culture, not just about lawyers, but it, it is true. It's, it's a greater problem. We have the opioid epidemic, as you all have read about, and, and it's a, a real problem throughout our nation, throughout our occupational groups. So here, here's my, I'm oh, sorry, I hit that damn microphone, sorry about that. Um, what I want to do today, I've got 15 minutes, I'll keep within my time, I'm gonna move very, very quickly, the slides are in your materials. Um, please feel free to contact me Later, if you'd like, I'm, I'm open to phone calls. I'm open to emails. I don't want anybody isolated. Nobody should be isolated after hearing what we're going to be presenting today. That, that's, that's what kills law students and lawyers, isolation. You just heard Eileen talk about that. So why should we care about law students and lawyers? We're mostly white privileged people in this culture at this time, very privileged. And, and, and yet we have some great compelling empirical evidence that shows that lawyers affect more of the private and public de decision making in this nation than any other occupational group. That's why we should care. Because if our lawyers are impaired, and so many are, at any given moment, in any given practicing bar association, one third of the actively practicing lawyers are significantly impaired. <coughs> They're either suffering from depression, from alcoholism, or, or, or chronically high levels of hostility and cynicism, which will kill them because of cardiovascular disease early. So that's what we're up against. Uh, um, and it hasn't changed in 30 years. We've got very good empirical research using very sound methodology, the study that was um, sent out to you is a convenient study that's not the greatest study in the world. It probably underestimates the problems as a result of not being, uh, there was a lot of self-selection of the people who sent in their data for that study. Um, that's that ABA study that, that, that was mentioned in the materials. So we've got other studies that, that don't suffer from methodological problems, and so I'm pretty sure about the data that I'm going to be discussing. Um, so first, we're going to talk a little bit about the scope of the problem. We're going to talk about the drivers, what causes this problem, and then we're going to talk about what you can do about it. Because everybody in this room 
has the capacity not, not to fall and, and not to die as Peter did. Everybody, I love working with lawyers. There's no better uh, type of profession, a professional to work with because we're so hardworking. And generally, if you get beyond the denial of minimization, the values are wonderful. And if you can get people back to the original values, why they came to law school, almost with that exception, those people make incredible differences in this world and can have um, a profound impact, even if they have fallen, even if they are uh, um, hurting. So, oops, no, just that one. Before law school, I only mentioned this, actually law students are healthier than the normal population before they get to law school. That's what the data show. And it takes just a matter of a few weeks and the pedagogy has begun to turn these souls. And we see in particular uh, um, that, that uh, um, we're gonna have a lot of folks beginning to, to uh, um, suffer from the externalities of the law school setting. You're gonna have this problem of, of the problems appearing in this first year and persisting and getting worse over the course of actively practicing years. Uh, um, we actually know that the, a lot of the alcoholism isn't brought to law school, it's generated in law school because of all the events around alcohol and the encouragement uh, um, and actual uh, I think looking the other way at the binge drinking that goes on at that event, those events. And Joe, um, Joe and, and Patrick will be talking about this, this addiction array being a progressive disease and only gets worse as, as people continue to um, engage in their behaviors that don't work well. So um, we, uh, because of the Sheldon Krieger work, um, they've done um, some longitudinal studies on law students and lawyers. What they've showed is that we actually know why the pedagogy fails and how come we set up our law students and lawyers to suffer. How, how come so many suffer? And we know um, that it actually, there's a kind of a rotational system that goes on. So at any given time, one third of the actively, actively practicing bar members are suffering from psychopathology, but that changes over time. It's a different part of the third, you know? It's a really hard business to, to stay healthy in because it's so replete with losses. And so, in particular, you know, we, we, we're having these issues go on, and the pedagogy, in particular, habituates people to the kind of overwork that Peter suffered from, the kind of of um, comparative worth that he engaged in. Um, all of that is caused by forsaking himself and his values. Um, and all of that's caused by for any of us who suffer from depression or alcoholism or drug abuse. We forsake ourselves. So what do we mean by depression? These are the symptoms that in particular reflect lawyers. And the one that, that really is is heart rendering and which I don't have a pointer here, but it's that increased social isolation that, that is actually uh, um, leads to, to suicide in, in some instances. We're the fourth leading professional group, um, occupational group for suicide. The pharmacists, the physicians, uh, um, and the, um, uh, who else? Um, the uh, dentists lead us. But we're, at, we're next, lawyers, law students. So if you have any of these symptoms, if you have more than two or three of these symptoms for longer than a couple weeks, you need treatment. You're starting that path. And you got to get treatment because with good treatment, you can get back to yourself. And that's so essential. And it doesn't happen very much in this culture because we don't encourage our law students to go to treatment. In fact, this bar punishes lawyers, our law students, for going. 
to treatment. You got to report if you go to treatment. We're changing those standards across the country and other bar associations. So you don't have to report if you've gotten the treatment. But if you have to report going for treatment, do you think you were going to go to treatment as a law student? No. Or to sit for the bar? No. No. So symptoms of addiction. Again, if you've got any two or three of these symptoms for longer than two, two weeks, you're suffering from the addiction array. And, and it only gets worse. And again, that increased social isolation is a killer. This one is a surprise for most people. You would think that, that you know, it's the nature of the business to be hostile and cynical as lawyers. Absolutely not. Before law school, people are much less hostile and cynical than normal population folks. But the law school does this to us. Now, hold in mind why I make such a big deal about this array. It does affect cardiovascular disease. Depression. We're 3.6 times more likely than any of the 104 occupational groups to suffer from depression. And remember, for lawyers and law, and law students, it's really dysphoria, a combination of depression, anxiety, and frustration, all wrapped up together. But we know that, that this is afflicting too many of us. For base rates, this is from the Washington State Bar Association. I developed and implemented a lawyer assistance program years ago, 87. And I did a, a, a stratified random sample of 10% of the actively practicing bar. Got a huge return rate. More than almost 70% responded to our survey. So these are great data. Notice MP stands for normal people. <laughs> ATS stand for attorneys. Now these are, these are base rates for female lawyers. 71% of the female lawyers, actively practicing female lawyers in the great state of Washington had sufficient negative consequences related to their alcohol use that by the Michigan alcohol screening test, they would be viewed as alcoholic. 71%. And that's true, and, and, and the data really don't change except for anxiety, you know? Women lawyers suffer from much greater levels of anxiety than, than um, normal population women. Not so much for depression, it's all in the same line. But for males, look at these numbers. Same damn problem with alcoholism. Two thirds, two thirds y'all. Shocking, shocking. So these are good data, and they haven't been really disabused since this study was published back in the night, um, 96. And um, it, they, still, they still have been corroborated by other studies. We've got a problem. So, hostility. This barefoot study is a classic. That stuff followed people for 30 years, and what they found is it, law school changed those folks. And if they graduated with high levels of hostility and cynicism, as measured by the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, lo and behold, they were 4.19 times more likely to die of cardiovascular disease. Huge. And by the way, being hostile and cynical doesn't, doesn't lead to the best purveyors of justice in this culture. We see in a lot of problems with that in our current, current political climate. It doesn't work. So now we'll come to the good news. What can you do about this? Because some of those symptoms, you're saying, oh, yeah, I've got, I got those symptoms. What can I do about this? You absolutely can do something about this. Y'all are so damn bright, so talented, and you've got great values. And that's the first thing that you've got to do. You gotta get back to those values that you started law school with. Don't let this pedagogy corrupt your soul. You know who you are. You need to get back to who you are. And you need to figure out how to practice law along the lines of who you are. And that greater consciousness about what your true values are is, is highly significant for you to hold on to through the vicissitudes of practice in the life of a lawyer.
And um, if you want it, you want a worksheet about how to out those values, please let me know. It's pretty simple. Your best decisions and your best interpersonal relationship uh, um, interactions all come from those values. That's who you are. That's what you want to write down across the competencies of being a human being. And you want to make sure you're acting congruently with those values when future decisions come along, when other relationship issues emerge. OK, got five minutes. I can do this. So I really encourage a lot of, lot of written reflections. Lawyers stay too much in their heads. That doesn't help. You saw the obsessive compulsive statistics. It doesn't help. Express yourself. Please write. We write so well. And that's a, a private form of expression. I'd love to have you share with, with kindred spirits, people who can engage in reciprocal relationship, who care, who are givers, not takers, who, who really fundamentally have similar values to you. If you're here, you're probably givers. A lot of takers won't give much time to these issues. Also, it's so important to integrate those values in your conscience uh, around those values throughout every day. It's important that you build a collegial environment. And to collaborate is so important. So much of what we do in the law can be done through collaboration. And those skills are, are often given short shrift by the hostile cynical types. But you know, and we got lots of evidence about this, that we're resolving so much through alternative, alternative dispute resolution at this point. It's increasing in, in nature and rate. And, and so we're beginning to get to this point where we can collaborate even better. And it's something that, as law students, I would really urge that you engage in. Don't go to that zero-sum competitive thing and worry about the next person outdoing you. Who cares? Who cares? You, in fact, can do anything you want as an alumni out of this law school. Don't compare yourself with others. So important. You know, if, if you're engaging in your lifelong relationships you have, particularly around your creative interest, you're going to be able to, to, to not become, uh, um, fall victim to the symptoms I've just talked about. This is one of the very best uh, um, tactics to stay healthy. Engage in strong reciprocal relationships and be creative in those relationships. Play music, write poetry, read poetry, go for hikes, you know, be a naturalist, be a humanist, something to engage those creative abilities. Respect your body. Too many of you are not getting enough sleep in this law school. You know, you need seven, eight hours of sleep every night. Too many of you forsake an exercise, eating junk food, setting yourself up for cardiovascular disease as you become more hostile and cynical. Please stop. Please stop. Please stop. Get back to what you know. All of that's incongruent with your values. Nobody has the value that I love junk food and will splurge on junk food. Nobody has that value. So pay attention to your signal emotional states. There are certain states that, that, know, that will lead you to understand that you've got to engage in a period of reflection and, and, and try to get back to your values. So for me, it's frustration. I'm frustrated. I need some time away. I've got to sit down and really reflect, write about where I'm at, what I want to do. That will be congruent with values. Finally, know when to seek help. If you're feeling isolated, gosh, please go get help. We got lots of good people in this law school, I'm sure of it. You'll find some kindred spirits in this law school. Please embrace those people. Start forming up in two-person, three-person, four-person support groups. 
provide the kind of respect and dignity that you're owed to each other. Don't let this pedagogy take you down. That's it. Great. So well, you. Uh, <laughs> you know, one thing, Andy, that uh, I want to mention uh, to all of you is Andy's done a lot of work on peer counts. I mean, you can see that comes out because when you get help, who do you go to? And uh, one very important, obvious source is peers and people you're already close to and maintain those ties. That's kind of the opposite of social isolation. Uh, of course, I want to remind everyone that we have someone from CAPS often either in the law school or they're more or less right across the street. Now, this is, I look at this and we've got a lot of practicing lawyers and few practicing lawyers, I'm going to be honest, CAPS is no longer open to us. <laughs> but that's our counseling, of course, and psychological services. But there are all sorts of resources to go there. And I, I just want to uh, second that. Thanks, uh, Joan. Thanks, Andy and Eileen. It's a pleasure to be here with you. I want to pick up really quickly on that point that Joe was just making about resources. We have somebody here in the audience who's a representative from the California Lawyers Assistance Program. So for practicing attorneys out there, that is certainly a resource that you could, you could turn to and find some uh, direction to other clinical resources. Patrick, who's you... that person? If you could raise your hand, thank you. So you can find that person right there. She'll hook you up. <laughs> thank you. Um, before I move into what I was actually planning to talk about today, I want to pick up really quickly on a theme that I've heard here really throughout our conversation so far, and that's isolation. Um, I certainly don't want to repeat or reiterate the very valid points that, that Andy and Joe were making about isolation and the need to disrupt any sort of isolationist tendencies that may be beginning to emerge during your law school experience. But I do want to add a little bit of a twist to that, and that really has to do with addiction and isolation. It was mentioned in my introduction that I'm the former director of a clinical treatment program for attorneys, judges, and law students who are struggling with addiction. And oftentimes, they were struggling with a co-occurring disorder, so addiction plus a mental health disorder. And where I really saw the significant impact of isolation was in that realm. And specifically, people's addiction tended to flourish when they were isolated. And they tended to be isolated as a result of their professional obligations and also as a result sort of as, you know, because of the personality traits and the behaviors that began to take root during their law school and then practicing lawyer years. So that's just another uh, sort of pitfall, if you will, of falling into isolation. It could really allow your use of substances to progress and to flourish, and you could find yourself in a position addicted to something, whether it be alcohol, drugs, or something else, and nobody was there to really sort of see it happening and to possibly raise a concern or, or you know, express their desire for you to go speak to somebody. So. I want to pick up, just make that note, and then I'll move into um, my slides. Do you know where those were? Oh, let's see here. Could be there. Just get right there. Just get them. Let's get these out. Um, I think you want. You know, I'm tempted to just say someone in this audience is better than I am, but I'm going to give it a try to start with. So let's let's look at Perfect. this. Thank you. Uh, that is the first, I'm quitting now. Uh, just the first like and last time I've managed any AV exercise. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Uh, so what I plan to talk to you a little bit about today is really sort of this current, the most current scope of the problem as we understand it, as it relates to substance abuse and mental health in the legal profession, practicing lawyers, so law students are certainly not included in this data. As th this was a study published in 2016 in the Journal of Addiction Medicine. It was a collaboration between the ADA and the Hazelden and Betty Ford Foundation where I was employed at the time. Andy mentioned that this was a convenience sample and I think that's actually an important note because for that reason I think it is likely that our findings are an underrepresentation of the true scope of the problem because people who were struggling the most, whether it be with their alcohol use, whether it be with their drug use, or whether it be with depression, anxiety, they were very unlikely to respond to a survey that was being promulgated by their state bar. 
those are people who aren't even opening their mail oftentimes or, or sort of keeping up with things. So I think it's, it's very reasonable to say that our findings, as troubling as they were, are likely an underrepresentation. We didn't have the ability to do a random sample because the 15 states who participated wouldn't release their uh, lists of practicing attorneys. But here's what we found. We found that 20%, 21% of licensed currently practicing attorneys qualify as problem drinkers using an instrument known as the Audit 10. It stands for Alcohol Use Disorders Identification Test. It tells you right in the title what it's measuring. That's the 10 question instrument. That measures volume and frequency of alcohol consumption, but also some of the problem behaviors that go along with that consumption. So it asks questions such as, have you ever failed to fulfill an obligation because of your alcohol use? Has somebody ever expressed concern over your alcohol use? Using that instrument, we found that 21% of licensed, and important note here, currently practicing attorneys in the United States out of a sample of 15,000 qualify as problem drinkers. That's a really high number, and it's higher certainly than you would find in the general population, and it is higher than in other um, professions that we compared to as well. But we also decided to measure a, a alcohol use a second way, and it's called the Audit C. It's an abbreviated version of the full 10 question audit. We wanted to make this calculation because it was important to compare to the medical profession in our view. It's often a profession that comparisons are made between the two, doctors and lawyers, right? They go hand in hand. We wanted to understand how we stacked up against the most current research on physician substance abuse. And the instrument that had been used the most frequently there was this Audit C. So that measures just volume and frequency of alcohol consumption. How much are you drinking and how often are you drinking it? It doesn't ask any questions about your subjective appreciation of the impact it's had on your life. It doesn't ask any questions about whether things have possibly gone missed or unfulfilled as a result. It's just volume and frequency. There, 36.4% qualify as problem drinkers. So you might be asking yourself, what's the difference? Why did you arrive at two? Why did you have two different findings, really, from the same data sample? It's our, it's our theory that lawyers often drink at an extremely high volume and frequency. Their consumption is extreme, but they perhaps don't experience the same level of problems or have the same level of consequences or they power through them or they fail to acknowledge them. So that's why if you're just looking at how much are they drinking and how often are they drinking it, that's 36.4%. And that's certainly in more in line with some of the higher findings from Andy's previous work. But then if you're looking at the impact that it's having on them and possibly their practice and their sort of life, that's when it comes down to 21%. I hope that distinction is clear to you. Um, and it's suggestive, really, of how lawyers do kind of power their way through their addiction and are often high functioning, although that's a complete myth that anybody could be in the grips of a, an addiction and truly be high functioning. Um, but that's certainly what we like to say. So between 21, excuse me, and 36%. It was notable that we found that younger attorneys in the first 10 years of their practice are struggling the most, both with their depression, anxiety, and stress, which I'll get to, but also with their alcohol consumption. So it's younger attorneys, first 10 years of practice, and those working in private firms. That's really sort of the perfect storm for highly problematic alcohol use, being young, working in a private firm. We also thought it was important to measure sort of subjective appreciation of the impact that substances may be having on someone's life. So we asked yes or no questions. Do you think that your use of substances has ever been a problem for you at some point in your life? You'll see that 23% said yes. Of that 23%, 43.7% said that the problem started within the first 15 years of coming into the profession. So these weren't necessarily problems or behaviors that they were bringing with them. Um, that, coupled with a couple of other findings, which I won't go into today, led us to what I believe was the most critical finding of the entire study. And that was that there is a high risk of developing an alcohol use disorder. There's a strong correlation bet between being in the early stages of one's legal career and a high risk of developing an alcohol use disorder. Obviously, correlation and causation are different things, but it is a strong correlation with a high risk. So that's possibly, you know, we're venturing into warning label territory on law school brochures when you, when you really unpack that a little bit. 
Those were findings related to alcohol use. Eileen's study, or Eileen's story rather, um, I, I should repeat or just sort of emphasize what Andy was saying about the impact of that story on the profession and really in my view the good that it has done. Sure, sure. It really did break through institutional denial across all sectors of the profession and it gave people also, in addition to breaking through the denial, it gave them the freedom to talk about something that they knew was there but it was sort of taboo or off limits to talk about. So uh, you really can't say how important that was. We also sought to measure drug use in our study. We didn't have great findings there because only a third of the people who answered the questions about their alcohol use and their mental health answered the questions about drug use. So you could read that one of two ways. Either lawyers don't use drugs, which I can tell you from counseling hundreds of them in a treatment center, they certainly do, and I'm sure both of you can obviously attest to that as well. Uh, but the more reasonable explanation is that even in the context of an anonymous online survey with no identifying data being collected, lawyers aren't going to discuss their drug use with you, and that's, that's pretty much the reality. So, but moving on to mental health, because this was, in my view, these findings were equally as compelling as what we found related to alcohol use. 28% of currently practicing attorneys are struggling with depression. If I could go back and rewrite the manuscript for this study, one of the things that I would have called out more clearly is that of that 28%, the majority are experiencing severe or moderate severe or extremely severe depression. So this is not mild depression, this is not transient depression, this is not, you know, it's, it's the real deal. And so it's a really significant pra uh, portion of practicing lawyers who are struggling. Also, high levels of anxiety and stress, um, the type of which can lead to impairment and really lead people to all sorts of additional problems, whether it be a problematic relationship with substances, you know, self-medication has been mentioned, and I can tell you, um, I don't know how many of the lawyers and judges, and we did get some law students in my treatment program, said that they started, that their problematic relationship with drugs or alcohol started out of self-medication. They never even really liked to drink that much, or they never even really liked to use drugs, but they were medicating, and it just sort of spiraled out of control as it is, you know, possible to, it's possible to happen with highly addictive substances. I want to start moving a little bit more quickly through this out of respect for how much time we have, but we also thought it was important to note what is keeping lawyers from getting help in the event that they need it. This may not surprise you based on your own experience to date in law school. Think about how preoccupied you are with your reputation and with your image and with what your peers think of you and possibly with what firms who may hire you think of you, you're probably more concerned with these things than you've ever been at any point in your life if you're like most law students and most lawyers. It is a transformational experience that really does lead to, quite frankly, a level of paranoia around what others are thinking of us. We're afraid of how that might be sort of viewed as a weakness or a deficiency or somehow paint us or cast us in this light that is unfavorable to our professional advancement. And that certainly was demonstrated in our study findings. We asked, what has kept you from getting help? Or hypothetically, should you need help in the future, why wouldn't you get it? Right. And it was not wanting others to find out they needed help, or concerns regarding privacy or confidentiality, a closely related concern. Um, so lawyer, law students were not saying, I wouldn't know where to turn, or I wouldn't have the resources. It was, I don't want other people to find out. So that's sort of the scope of the problem as we currently understand it based on the most, um, you know, the most current data that is, that is available. I want to talk quickly now about some of the solutions, some of the things that are beginning to take hold in the profession because we are turning a corner. Um, so far we've been talking a lot about the scope of the problem and the problems are significant and they're real and they're probably worse really than most of us even really fully appreciate. But there has been a level of responsiveness both to that study and a law student study that was published in the um, Journal of Legal Education in 2016 as well, dealing with law student well-being and demonstrating similar themes. Elevated levels of dysfunction and substance abuse and a lower level of a willingness to seek help. And all of which was sort of predicated on Andy's previous work. So a group of stakeholders came together in response to those two those two studies, and we formed the National Task Force on Lawyer Wellbeing. That task force, and I'll tell you who, these are the groups that are represented in the National Task Force. 
on lawyer well-being. I'm one of the members of the task force. We wrote a report outlining recommendations for all sectors of the legal profession to begin making changes, to begin doing things to reduce the level of suffering in the profession, the level of struggling in the profession. That report, and this was the cover page of it if you haven't seen it, just so you know if you're looking for it online, that report was published in August of last year. It's about 75 pages total, and there are recommendations in there. It's broken out by sector, so there are recommendations for law schools, recommendations for legal employers, recommendations for the judiciary, and we talk about ways that the profession can begin to get a better handle on these problems. We define well-being not just as the absence of illness, so it's not just the absence of depression or the absence of addiction. That doesn't necessarily mean you are enjoying great well-being. It's more, it's much larger process and phenomenon. It's a continuous process in which you're seeking to thrive in various dimensions of your life. I would direct you all to this report if you haven't seen it. Um, it's certainly worth studying and sort of reading on an academic level, but it's also very useful on a practical level, and I suspect you will find things in there that may be useful to you today, but will certainly be useful to you as you advance through the profession and ultimately into leadership roles, hopefully, within the profession. We articulate three reasons why it's important for the profession to focus on lawyer well-being. Essentially, it's good for business, it's good for our ethical compliance, and it's also the humanitarian, it's the right thing to do. That final point was brought to life by Eileen's story. I mean, the struggling and the suffering that Peter went through um, prior to his death. I have to say, as tragic as that was, it wasn't that surprising to me, and I think I told you this when we, when we spoke, because I had patients coming through treatment who were sort of in a similar state of crisis, and some of whom have since relapsed and died. Untreated addiction and mental health disorders kill people, but prior to that, they can derail careers, they can disrupt families, and they can certainly cause a lot of pain and suffering, much of which is completely unnecessary because they're both treatable conditions. So in my view, that's the most important reason for us to focus on these issues. Sure, yeah. But the ethical and business um, reasons are often what will motivate people in the profession to, to get more serious. Um, so let me, I have just a, a few minutes left, so I'll, I'll emphasize this. Some of the threshold recommendations that we outline is that every sector of the legal profession must support lawyer well-being. As important and vital as the work of lawyer assistance programs is, uh, they can't handle this entire burden. This is really up to all of us, beginning with you as law students to take, to take better control over your own well-being. Um, but it's really up to everybody who has any role in the legal profession to prioritize these issues. Um, each of us should take a leadership role within our own spheres to change the profession's mindset and then to transform passive denial of problems to proactive support for change. Um, the institutional denial of these problems over the years has been um, extraordinary. I don't think it was an accident that so many decades had passed between studies on lawyer impairment and lawyer substance abuse and depression. We as a profession, uh, present company excluded, have not wanted to look at these issues and certainly not dedicate um, research resources to them. This is an infographic from that task force report. I think that this will um, be eye-opening on one hand and probably a little bit hopeful for you on the other. On the one side, you see our challenges in the profession, and then on the other side, you see our potential, and really all of the things that could be waiting for us and are waiting for us when people are in a better state of well-being. Contributing to society, that's a huge one, right? The, the connection between, and this was alluded to um, earlier, but the connection between lawyer impairment and access to justice issues, if you think about the critical, pivotal role that lawyers play in the proper functioning of society, um, if we're not well, society is ultimately, the public is ultimately who pays the, the larger price. Finally, I'll, I'll end here and say, the current president of the ABA, Hillary Bass, has been very proactive in this space. She formed a working group to improve lawyer well-being. I'm also a member of this group. And some of the work that we've been doing, it's ongoing, and we hope to have a lot, comp a lot accomplished by the end of um, August. We have a law firm focus because that is sort of where a lot of these problems really manifest in the most pronounced ways. 
Um, we're working on drafting model policies for the profession and spearheading other initiatives that will help us get to the culture and make cultural changes. There was a, this is, next piece is sort of breaking news. There was a resolution passed just a few days ago at the ABA mid-year meeting in Vancouver, and that resolution, Resolution 105, urges all stakeholders in the profession, including law firms, including law schools, to adopt the recommendations set forth in that task force report, which I was just mentioning. So, obviously, ABA resolutions are non-binding, um, but we hope, and it is our expectation, that the ABA sort of putting their full faith and credit and their name behind this and encouraging all stakeholders to get serious about these issues and to just start doing something and to adopt those task force recommendations will continue to move the ball forward. We're also planning a conference in spring, it's April 26th, I believe, in Washington, D.C., where we're going to be inviting a lot of leaders from the profession, especially in the law firm space, to come together for a brainstorming workshop about crafting better institutional responses to what are very systemic and long-standing problems. So, bottom line, with everything that I was just saying, is that there is a lot happening in order to finally get us to a better place. My hope and my suspicion is that five years from now, the state of lawyer well-being, it, we're not going to have parity with the general population. Forget it. That's too big a mountain to climb in such a short period of time. But I do suspect that we will be in a better place and have lower levels of substance abuse and lower levels of mental health distress. Um, and if we can get there incrementally over time, uh, I'll, be, I'll be thrilled, and as I'm sure everyone here on this panel will be. Thank you. Well, I've got some great questions from, uh, from everyone. And um, they kind of fall in categories. And so I'm going to uh, start them in two categories are really associated with people that are in law school and are marginalized in some ways or have discrimination. What is the, the, the special problems that they face? And are there different things we can do about that? A lot of these things overlap. Uh, one, uh, one group are people that have suffer from mental illness. And another group, I think, is generally uh, underrepresented, for example, non-white, or uh, in, in any other way, a kind of a member of a marginalized group. And uh, I just want to throw it open to the panelists to, to speak on that. You want me to start? Sure. I have no idea. So to, to me, this is um, um, one of those questions that our law schools have not really done very well by over the years. Um, we have expanded um, the number of women that, that are, are coming to our law schools, thank God. Um, we are beginning to expand uh, um, the ethnic diversity, the cultural diversity in our law schools, thank God. Um, but we still have um, so much um, aggression and microaggression going on within those settings, even in an august setting like this. Um, there, there is, um, because of that kind of cynicism, hostility thing that I talked about, it's modeled, frankly, by my colleagues, you know, who are teaching the Socratic process and are shaming and humiliating our students because they're not doing it very well, to be blunt about it. You know, there's this, this provocative approach that, that's modeled. Um, and it, it's max of incivility. And so that's what we got to work against. We need to speak up against the incivility within all settings throughout our law school. We need to call it out when we see it, you know, that when it affects our relationships with others. We, we need to make sure that, that um, we become more aware of our own lack of, of um, tolerance and our own ignorance about diverse issues. And I, I agree with that. And the two quick points that I would make as it relates to, I think it's a really important issue that you're raising, Joe, as it relates to the diversity challenges within the legal profession. I think there are two points that are specifically applicable to addiction and mental health. 
The first really has to do with the historical lack of diversity in the profession. It's sort of been a, a male-dominated, you know, white male-dominated old boys club. And what that has, in my view, and sort of my working theory on this, is that that has played into the elevated levels, certainly, of alcoholism and, and drug, drug use, right? Because it's sort of that work hard, play hard mentality, old boys club, you know, we're heavy drinkers, hard drinking. And through that very sort of um, non-diverse population, we've had a glorification of unhealthy behaviors, a deification of, of unhealthy people, and sort of the, the things that we celebrate and the, the, you know, the way that we've uh, approached that and viewed that. And then the second point that I'll make really relates to um, the LGBT community and in the legal profession. The LGBT community has significantly higher levels of addiction than, than the sort of general population as well. So when you're talking about a minority group within the legal profession, which also has heightened levels of addiction and mental health distress, you're really talking about a compound phenomenon where there's even more vulnerability. So this is kind of a familiar thing for those of us in uh, mental health, which is if you've got other stressors because you're poor, you face microaggressions, real aggressions, and et cetera, all that's cumulative. And it's going to affect everything, including, not surprising, your sense of happiness and your resilience and your susceptibility to a lot of things. You certainly can. And I, yeah. I, on the other hand, I want to argue that, that those who are marginalized uh, um, can, can actually uh, um, find those kindred spirits, make a difference within this setting, and, and, and through that, that um, collegial approach um, sustain their health. So when we're talking about things like our student groups working together, as I know some have had to look at mental health they issues sponsor this. And, and to sponsor this, that's a, a very health promoting activity. Uh, you know, we have two questions that are a little similar, just in the interest of time, we have so many questions. I'm going to just take these. This basically says, what is Stanford doing about this, Stanford Law School? So I can't really ask Andy or Eileen or anyone to answer, uh, answer this. Uh, uh, one is for Stanford Law uh, faculty, and the other is, uh, what aren't we doing that we should be doing? Uh, on the one hand, we're doing a lot more than ever before, as some people know. Uh, in the first year, Ron Tyler uh, teaches a mini course on mindfulness. We have a course on mindfulness with Ron and uh, Tom Fenner. Uh, uh, I do a little mini course on anxiety, and uh, uh, we've had someone from CAPS here now in the law school to make it a little easier to get to there. Uh, many other student groups and people participating in that, and I know Jory and uh, Liz and I talk about this a lot. I have a mental health law uh, lab, and I do a wellness cast. But with all that, like every other law school, we are a little bit reeling from what seems to be more serious problems than before. It might be some of those are just out of the closet, but I don't think that's everything. So I think the way to respond to that is to ask, uh, just in general for suggestions on what more we could be doing. I've given a few things that we're doing, but obviously there's some things we could be doing and we're not, and let me just ask people uh, uh, to respond to them. I think did you have? Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I, let's see, there are... Uh, Do you want a response? Could we oh, one? yes. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I would say it's, it's critical to really sort of communicate both explicitly and implicitly the value of seeking help early and also to work in whatever way you can to destigmatize the topics of addiction and mental health because law students are petrified, generally speaking, of acknowledging that there might be a problem. And what that does is you, whether they realize it or not, it feeds into a level of denial and it just they, they stuff things down and they keep it stuffed down and then ultimately it has to come out and it, and it does. And, and that's when they might find themselves in a true state of crisis. So to the extent that you can just sort of normalize the conversation, encourage people to feel comfortable that what they're actually doing is demonstrating better professional judgment by getting a handle on things and to sort of prioritizing their well-being. And I would urge that Stanford launch its um, peer counselor program. 
um, so that the student body is trained to serve as peer counselors. And our peer counselors at the University of Washington go out in pairs. One law student or one lawyer can screw up. Together in pairs, they never screw up. And, and they do wonderful work with their peers. Wonderful work with their peers. And we're beginning to change the climate you know, around the incivility we're seeing because our peer counselors come from all walks of life and they're just dedicated human beings and their posters are plastered across our bulletin board. And so our students feel like they can reach out and they know that, that their confidences will be protected. It's a, it's, uh, it's a, a great point. I'm gonna ask one other question then I wanna give a couple people from the audience an opportunity to, uh, 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 to talk, yeah. I mean, we're, that is such a good question about what's going to change at Stanford, and I don't just mean Stanford, but I remember since my experience as being married to somebody that was in law school, and he was not in an Ivy League law. It wasn't like this. It was in New Hampshire, but he was in a really prestigious IP program. And I just remember that even then it was kind of this, and I know um, Larry Krieger, I think, because yes. I'm in touch with him, has done a lot of studies, this like winner take all. and. Peter was acutely aware of where everyone was in that race to be the top. And he, he was the top in his class and gave the, the speech. But it was this, I mean, and, and it was not discouraged by the faculty. And also the whole idea of the humiliation and the Socratic, I don't know if that's the way it's taught here, but it is terrifying for them. Every day it felt like he was going to battle in the Coliseum. And I mean, is that something that's likely to change at all in, in law education or no? That's gonna stay. Uh I think the Socratic method has really changed from when I was in, in school. Uh, but uh, that's a comparison that's hard to, hard to document, but it's, it's, it's well taken. I, you know, there are so many good questions here. I'm not going to get to them, unfortunately. I want to apologize in advance. I want to give an opportunity for one or two of my colleagues to uh, say something. And uh, Robbie, I know that you had had something that you uh, wanted? You got a smart question there. What's that? About His question. The, uh, the School of Medicine project for uh, law and psychiatry. Yeah, I'm not going to, I'm just not going to get to it. I got it. Okay. But it wasn't, but I'm going to ask Robbie oh, if she oh, wanted. Yeah, it wasn't, sorry. Okay. So, sorry. I just want to res respond to that really that last point really quickly because I think that is absolutely correct but it also requires because it truly is a structural within the legal profession problem it requires a bridge with the law firms and people who are hiring lawyers as well because ultimately law students are being trained to get jobs somewhere right mm -hmm. and and law schools and the law school experience is often taking cues from sort of 
the, the people that are ultimately going to hire the law students. And there needs to be more of a dialogue there and more of a partnership around solving this on a structural systemic level. It's not something that just sort of one group can address. And you know, when we talk about pedagogy, I know some of the proposals to get specific are more collaborative work. I mean, when you think about how would you reteach more clinics, more, clinics, mm -hmm. more collaborative. Now, law schools vary in their degree of clinics. So mm -hmm. I think I don't want to I don't want to put Stanford up against other law schools. Sure. I think we we probably have more clinical opportunities than some, but that doesn't mean we have as much collaborative work, for example, as we might. You know, I'm mindful of everyone's time. I'm certainly willing to kind of stay longer, uh, uh, but uh, and answer, for example, some of the questions I didn't get to. But I wonder if this would be an appropriate time just to uh, thank all of you, thank our student associations for sponsoring it, and uh, thank you, fellow panelists. Thank you.